writing articles on the top Illuminati families in 1992. And, and then the readers, my readers of my article, uh, they suggested you should put all these articles together into a book. And that's, and that's how the book came about. So it was actually written before 95. 95 was when it got collated into a book. And, and so that, that's important uh, item for people to understand because I had a friend who's an English professor and he started reading the book and he got really, really upset and just said, I can't read this book. It, it doesn't flow because, mm. because it wasn't written from front to back as a book. It was written as article. So when you finish one chapter, you know, yeah. it might in the next chapter repeat something or just jump to it. it yeah, each chapter flows fine because it was an article. But anyway, so that's all, what happened. That makes a lot of sense. It, it reminds me of um, Eugene Peterson. Uh, he wrote a, a, a book or so he wrote the message Bible but he was writing articles and they were just to his church and he was, um, you know, really learned in, in Hebrew and Aramaic. And so he was updating it. So, you know, the people in his church who were, I guess from his own words are a bunch of ruffians and outcasts and people who were just new to the faith. So I, I guess what you were doing was trying to give people information that they could, um, in a way that they could digest in, a, in an article. Now, are you, are you, did you go to school for, are you, have you always been a writer or how did that come about? Um, I didn't, I didn't even um, look at your bio. Were you a pastor or how did you, how did you get into, um, I guess, having people want to read your articles and hear your message? Well, <clears throat> I had a calling and that was given to me in dreams um, and that were obviously dreams from the Lord. And I got a calling to expose the corruption in the church. Mm -hmm. But by extension, that meant that I had to expose what's going on in the world because you can't understand what's going on in the churches unless you understand the bigger context of what's going on in the world. And right. so when I first got that calling, I, th that calling along with the calling was to write down what uh, the Lord had shown me. And I came out with seven books on Christian doctrine, um, which I just gave out free. Mm -hmm. Um but then people talked me, Christians talked me out of my calling. And it wasn't until like 10 years later that I got back to doing it. Um, so I was a little bit like Jonah, you know, yeah. God calls him to do something and then he runs for a moment and then he has to suffer for not doing his calling, which I had to suffer. And then I finally got back into doing my calling. I have always been able to write very well and research very well. Those are just gifts that I, or abilities that I have. Um, and uh, so, so that's, that's how I, I always knew I was going to be a writer just because I love to read and write. I actually like to write more than I like to talk. And that's, that's something. <laughs> Well, that, that's an amazing, um, that's really cool. It sounds a lot like some of my story. I've had some interesting visions and God's said certain things to me and it sounded very outlandish. Um, that was one of my questions for you. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, did anybody try to dissuade you from your calling or did you have any pushback from leadership or anything? Um, as it pertains to this subject, because I think when you were writing this, not many people were talking about the behind the scenes of, of even 
the religious mountain or anything else having to do with society. Um, I've gotten a lot of persecution, which is not something I talk about. A lot of persecution from the established churches. I think this is the first time in 40 years I've ever mentioned that. Yeah. Um, because I don't want to turn people away from Christ. Um, and then I, I've also, because I was exposing some heavy duty stuff uh, uh, with uh, concerning the Illuminati, which is the global elite running things. Because I was exposing some really big secrets, things that had been secret for centuries, thousands of years even. And um, so there was a lot of pushback there. There were a number of attempts on my life. And that's, no where, and that's where one has to realize that I had a calling from God because he sovereignly, miraculously, protected my life a number of times in their attempts to kill me. And if it hadn't been for his, him, if God hadn't given the provision for me to carry out the calling he gave me, I'd have never been able to do it. It's sort of like Moses going before the, at, at the time, the, um, Egypt was the world power, you know. He had to go before, and that would be like, going in front of Putin or going in front of uh, Biden and and telling them, you know, what God told you. I mean, it's not going to go over very good. Yeah. I think what happened is that there's an establishment and then there's a paradigm that is shifting, which goes against the establishment and also calls into question rituals and traditions and I think things that we sort of just take as as fact and that's what was eye-opening to me about this subject of the Illuminati and everything that goes with it I mean I think that's one part of it I did want to ask you sort of the genesis of your faith um because I know not everything's linear but how, I mean, how did you even get into, I, I know the dream came and you, you know, you had the word from the Lord, but how would you even get into starting to research something like this? Like, uh, what did the Lord kind of put on your heart to give you, you know, some sort of boost of direction? Well, uh, initially, the most important turning point in my life was, uh, and, and you read in the book of Acts how Paul, who was, his name originally was Saul, mm -hmm. a Pharisee, how he was converted to Christ miraculously. And I was converted to Christ in much a similar fashion as, as Paul. And, uh, my whole life turned around and yeah. and then at that time when i gave my life completely to christ i realized that there i realized the basics about the world it's what mm -hmm. you, you could say i was awake back then and i had high school teachers that realized that that would point me towards books bless their hearts like they had me read brave new world or 1984 mm -hmm. and and books that were readily available for me to understand better what they sensed where i was at and then i received an appointment uh, uh to west point united states military academy to be trained as an officer and they taught me total obedience. And then I realized I didn't want a military career as a conscientious objector. I didn't want to be in Uncle Sam's army. I wanted to be in the Lord's army. So um, at that point, I resigned 
and resigned from West Point. And I determined to take the one lesson that they had taught me really well, which was total obedience, total instant obedience, and apply that to God. And when I did that, the whole Bible looked different. And that's maybe what one reason why the Lord could use me is I was just totally dedicated to him and obeying whatever he asked and whatever the scriptures asked. And um, but it was a few years after after all this before I received um, my calling. And OK, I'll, I'll leave it at that and let you ask your next question. OK, no, thank you for that. That's um, yeah, that's that's actually very astounding. I think that uh, from my perspective, I think the Lord probably put some breadcrumbs in front of you and was having you grow and mature into um, taking on the calling. Um, which, yeah, I, I like your antidote with Moses and Pharaoh, and I, I, I actually thought about Elijah and Jezebel and and how yeah. he gives his word, and then he's on the run for his life. And then, you know, the Lord says to him, you know, there's many like you who haven't bent the knee, you know, and that, you know, that would be my encouragement, encouragement to you that, you know, the books that you're the book that you wrote, the articles that you, it was a continuation of what the Lord wanted to do. Um, so I, I firmly believe that, you know, it was, it's worth it, you know, and I think that the work that you did is um is still i think right now is very pertinent um but i, I think some of a, a lot of mainline christians don't know about it and so even some of the people that are gonna um listen to this podcast they don't know exactly you know who who this you know this group who calls themselves the illuminated ones who they are where they come from um I've heard, you know, Kazar Kazaria, the Kazarians. I've heard uh, names like Rothschild, Rockefeller, Vanderbilts. You know, we hear about these people, but um, you know, how? To, and from your from your perspective, from what you've you know gathered in all your research over the years, what, what's a good way to sort of describe you know the genesis of these these groups and and, and I guess how it relates to the church because that's I guess that was what kind of got you on that path. Right. So when we look at the Old Testament, we see way back um, around Moses' time, the scriptures are saying all the kings assembled against God's people. We fast mm -hmm. forward to David's time, and we, we read in Psalms, all the kings of the earth conspire against God. And then you fast forward to Micah, and, and, which is uh, centuries ahead. Um, and again, you still have all the kings uniting against God's people. Now, who is a king and why is a person a king? A person is a king because of his bloodline. So when you say all the kings of the earth are united against God, you, what you're really saying, in effect, if, if you understand like mathematical substitutions, you're saying the bloodlines are all united conspiring against God. And that's true. What Satan has done is he's told people, if you will serve me, I will give you power. I will give you money. And this is being done in secret, but it's happened over many centuries. And so the Rothschilds have secret uh, genealogy books that trace them back to Nimrod. So we're going clear back to early genesis uh and, and and so this rebellion has been going on a long time and they became the religious leaders um so, uh, some of the illuminati trace back to the uh egyptian priesthood they they trace back to the priests that were in, in jesus's time conspiring to kill him and uh so I know a lot of people like to put labels on things, but I came to the conclusion that that's counterproductive, that the best way to understand it is this is just a satanic conspiracy 
against humanity. Mm-hmm. And to put a label on it doesn't do justice because some of these people, um, you know, uh, for instance, um, a Rothschild descendant that I was helping to get out of the, out of the Illuminati, their husband was a Christian minister. So, you know, if you're like saying, okay, the Rothschilds are Jews, therefore Jews are bad, you know, well then are you going to include this particular person, uh, this person's family? Because mm-hmm. they're not Jews, they're Christians. And he's a minister, he's a Christian minister, you know. Right. Um, uh, another lady that I was helping out of the Illuminati, her father had been an Assembly of God minister, and but he told her, he said, we're secretly Jewish, but, uh, but they were Illuminati. So in that case, although he looked like a Christian minister, um, he actually did have a Jewish lineage, but it was hidden. So again, I, I say in, these are just two examples of countless that I could give um, that I know personally. Yeah. Labels don't suffice to really identify who's evil, but you have to understand how Luciferianism works. You know, uh, you have to understand how the occult works. And, and I'm going to explain that real quickly here. Um mm-hmm. Occult, arcane, and esoteric, all three words mean exactly the same thing. Occult, esoteric, and arcane mean exactly the same thing. They mean hidden knowledge. In other words, you have the exoteric and the esoteric. What that means is, is this hidden knowledge is is the reality, the occult reality, but evil puts on a good face right yeah so yeah. let's say you've got a an evil fraternal organization well you do benevolence and you say we we our purpose is to do all this benevolence but then while everybody's looking at you and thinking oh what a good group they do benevolence that's what they're for you can do all kinds of evil behind it and so there's a mask the occult has has a mask. So every time you bump into the occult world, esoteric, there's it's hidden. The reality is hidden. And right. there's even different names. Some of these organizations have an exoteric name, but then once you get into the organization, you find out they have a hidden name, you know. Or right. likewise, you may have your public name but when you get into the organization they give you an esoteric they give you a um your fraternity's name so this this is the way it works so what you see is not what you get and i i wrote three massive books exposing i i had the privilege to expose the trauma-based mind control which yeah. works off a of multiple personality disorder so they, right? intent- so they intentionally split the minds of their own people um, so they can create a good personality for every day. And then they have all of these horrible people, all these horrible alters, personalities that are satanic and evil underneath. So a person can be a person can look you straight in the face and say, oh, I would never do an occult ritual. I would never sacrifice somebody. And you could look them eye to eye and believe them because that personality would actually believe what they're saying because they're dissociated from the rest of the personalities in the mind that are evil. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. And, and yeah. Trauma-based uh, mind control. I think it was... Um... I think it got exposed with the CIA with MK Ultra, but it, it from my right. understanding, it actually goes back to Egyptian times. They would do this to right. their, I guess, their kings yeah. that were about to be king. I guess they would 
do the rituals on them. Right. So a friend of mine, he became a friend of mine after he read my, my the first book on the trauma-based mind control. And its title was The Illuminati Formula Used to Create an Undetectable Total Mind Controlled Slave. I didn't want to shorten the title. It kind of old-fashioned to have a long title. Yeah. Anyway, what happened in his life was he was a missionary for particular, I'll call it a denomination. I won't get mm -hmm. into what group he was of right now, keeping it yeah. simple. And we could probably guess, though, you went on a two-year mission, right? And he wore a black tie and a little black uh, name tag. <laughs> yes, exactly. You got it. LDS. <laughs> yeah. And um, wow, you, you got that right off the bat. So, yeah, he, he was an LDS missionary. Uh, a lot of their young men do that. He was really dedicated, hardcore Mormon. And he couldn't, he couldn't procreate. He couldn't have children. It was a problem, physical problem he had. But his wife got pregnant. And, and she could look him eye to eye and say, no, I have not had sex with anyone. So the conclusion was that this was an immaculate conception, a miracle by God, you know. But then he had he had eight miracles, eight immaculate conceptions before he realized that the bishop was banging his wife. But wow. she could look him eye to eye and and convince him that she hadn't done anything. Why? Because with this trauma based mind control, the front personality can be as innocent and sweet and godly as as possible. It's what's deeper down that's that's so evil and disgusting. And this is the way the Illuminati can hide their evil deeds. And so finally he realized, he figured out that the, the bishop was buggering her. And then he read my book and it made his whole life make sense. And he was so grateful somebody had made his life make sense. A number of people have been have been grateful to me. <laughs> uh, wow, I can only imagine. So that means that um, going back to, I guess, when we, we were talking about, you know, the genesis of it. And I like the way you put that because it, it puts a, a better framework on it. Because I think my, even myself doing research, you know, you come across the Masonic, then you come across the Illuminati, then you come ac across the Council 300. And it, it, it sounds a lot like to me after, you know, doing my own research, there's a lot of compartmentalization and I think there's some purpose behind it. And I, I think it, it confuses people as to who's really in charge. And I think people, they stop at, okay, it's these people doing it. But I think we as Christians, we can have a broader perspective and understanding like this is a part of the spiritual war that we're in. This is a part of um sort of what you were saying this luciferianism where there's people that are actually being taken advantage of there's people that don't even know half the things they've done and you know when they have these bleed through memories or they go through counseling you know they they come to jesus some of them because they're like you know they're like oh my gosh like this is not you know who i am this is not what i want to be about and I think it, um, I don't know, I think it sheds light on the fact that this, this world we're living in is, um, it's much more, it's much more, I guess, clouded in, in than what we can realize. And um, yeah, I think it's, I think the word that came to mind was just a priesthood. They're creating a false priesthood, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, the, you, you hit on it, and I was going to ask you, because um, I know in your book you talk a lot about, you know, you're very, you sound uh, very patriotic, you know, and, um, you know, I, I believe that America has a part to play in um, what God is doing, meaning like we have resource and we have a huge Christian base, you know, um, but I wanted to ask you, what, what do you think God is trying to show his people? Like, there's people like you now that are actually 
writing books. I'm not sure if you heard of a guy named Daniel Duvall, but he had a lady on his show. I think her name was Sue Ford and her real name was Esther. And, and she was a twin. She was twinned by, I guess, Joseph Mangala. And I think she didn't know it until, you know, much years, years later that she had a twin or something like that, you know? But anyways, um, I guess the question is, is what do you think God's doing through, um, I guess, this awakening process? Like he's given you information. He's given you dreams. He's put people in your path. You've helped, you know, set people free. You know, what do Christians do now in this, in these days of Noah, you know? Okay. So first going back to her um, support, she has also gone by the pen name Bryce Taylor. And I know her personally. Wow. Um, she came to a, a two of my Prophecy Club talk. If anybody can get a hold of my 1995 Prophecy Club talk, they've pretty well scrubbed it from the internet, but you might be able to find it somewhere. I, I recommend people, highly people listen to that because it's such a good overview, such a good foundation of my material um oh and now i've forgotten your question what would well i was gonna question, say what was the question? yeah i even forgot what i, I you know because you, as you're speaking i'm like oh my gosh this there's a lot here i guess what i wanted to say was or ask you is okay now that we know okay let's not get so um uh spread out with okay who they are illuminati masons all that stuff you know we just nail it down okay this is the work of the enemy you know yeah what do how do christians respond once they have this information in hand what well, you know what okay. what can we do I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna jump in here so what christians should have done from the very beginning is take the scriptures at face value there's a lot of people that are nominal christians they claim to be christians but they don't give any credibility to the scriptures. Even if they give lip service to believing the Bible, they really don't. And yet the the scriptures are God inspired and they're true. And they a select men over thousands of years were inspired by God to write certain things. And that distillation of wisdom has been put together and called the Holy Bible. Um, so if you look like in the book of first John, and you're going to see that, you know, a, several of these new Testament books make it really plain that if you love the world, you're a, an enemy of God and that the world hates God, that the ruler of this world is Satan and he comes as an angel of light. You know, if people would take that at face value, it, it's right there in front of them. So what I'm getting at is, is there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Satan, which you could call the kingdom of death. Um, and then there's the kingdom of life, which is the kingdom of heaven or the, uh, the kingdom of God. And I know some people like to split hairs and say, the kingdom of Christ is different than the kingdom of God. They're, they're missing really the, the bigger picture. You've got two kingdoms. And you can choose what kingdom you want to be in. If you go to Deuteronomy 30, it just repeatedly in that chapter, God says, I set before you death or life. Choose death or choose life. And... That's the same thing that we have today. You can join our American culture, which is a culture of death. You can get tattoos of skulls. You can celebrate Halloween. You can, you can, you can listen to Grateful Dead. You can listen to, uh, you can be part of this world that's a cult of death. Mm -hmm. Or you can separate yourself from that world and become a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's it's a choice, just like clear back in Deuteronomy, way back in, 
in Moses's time, it was the same thing. You could choose one of two paths. You want to you want to have life or you want to have death. And along that lines, if you're wondering what the spirit is going to back, the spirit gives life, it says in the scripture. So if you make any choice for life, then you're going with the what the spirit would want. I'll give you an example. Well, should I smoke? Well, is smoking going to be part of the kingdom of death and, and create death? Or is it going to give you life? You know, I mean, uh, in some rare instances, I suppose smoking a cigarette might give you life. I mean, there might be some extreme examples. But in general, having a smoking habit is going to use up your money, is going to give you lung cancer, you know. So this, we can choose life. We can choose what the spirit wants. The spirit gives life. The spirit wants us to have life. Christ said, I came to give you life and life more abundant. So he didn't just come to give us eternal life, but an abundant life here on earth. So this yeah. is what we have to choose. And uh, he uh, there's very few people out there that recognize that there's two kingdoms. The Amish do. The Amish go, the old order Amish, um, they go, you know what? We don't want to be part of the world. You know, we, we want to, if we can at all be possibly um, be off the electric grid, we want to. If, if we're, we can be, have our own transportation without being dependent on on the auto manu world's auto manufacturers, we will. They've tried to separate themselves from the world, see? And this, this is really the answer of what we're facing now because they have weaponized every system against us. The educational system, the financial system, the health system, every system out there has been weaponized against us. And so if, if you want to go with the world systems, you're going to pay a price. Yeah. That's well said. And I think what you what you hit on was there's a lot of gray area that we operate in. And that's even within the church. There's a lot of things that are non-negotiable, like obviously the Ten Commandments and following the law, but then there's a lot of gray area as to how we operate as a people of God. And I think, uh, you know, it's funny, even as you were saying, speaking, I was like, what about Christmas and Easter? You know, like um, I three years ago stopped celebrating Christmas, not because I don't like gifts, but I just for <laughs> me and my family and what we do as a family, as we have a business it's really hectic around Christmas time. So it sort of went well for us just to celebrate the holidays a little earlier and then do Hanukkah, um, which can be a mess for some people too. Um, but I, I guess the, my next question then is, okay, so we pull out, you know, or we, we sort of pull out of some of the systems or we change our thinking on the systems and we take the Bible at face value how does, you know, how, I guess, you know, a lot of Christians that are listening to this podcast. They're probably on par with a lot of the stuff you're saying. Like it, it some of it might sound okay. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Didn't know that. I'm gonna look into that, you know, but for the most part, I'm, I'm guessing whatever 30,000 listens I've had, they're, they're right on par, but how do they then go out and, you know, quote unquote proselytize, the people of God that are in the mainline churches or what, what is it that, you know, we, we can do to start to get people aware of, okay, we have two kingdoms, you know, this earth is, is the prince of the air is, is roaming about trying to capture souls and, um, you know, lead this end time agenda. Um, what do we say to those types of people, you know, or is there nothing to say? And I guess it just is what it is. There's a remnant and there's not. That's a good question. Um, the, the situation is this. Unless God saves us, we're not going to be saved. And somehow there has to be some point that touches people's hearts 
and wakes up their minds and and breaks that spell. What you have is you have people that have a demonic spell over them and that spell has to be broken. Different things will break it, but you know, it, it with one person it might be um, you know, they discovered that the medical system has lied to them. With another person, they might be studying, a, they might be interested in a particular aspect of history and realize, whoa, I've been lied to. Now, Norman Dodd, he was put in charge of the Un-American Activities Foundations, the Un-American Activities of the Foundation. It was a committee for Congress. Mm-hmm. And he went and investigated the Carnegie and, uh, Institute for Peace. And the, the circumstances at that particular time were just ideal that they were, you know, they are switching leadership and blah, blah, blah. So they allowed them, uh, I can't remember what it was, 15 or 30 minutes in their warehouse of uh, archives. And they didn't think he, you know, with that short amount of time that he would find anything. And they thought, you know, that would just uh, prove to him that there wasn't anything there. But he went in and he had a secretary with him and he went to town and he discovered a document where the Carnegie Endowment for Peace in in World War One had written a letter or memo um, to Woodrow Wilson, who was our president, telling him in uh, in no uncertain terms, you are to prolong this war. Mm -hmm. And when he, here's a, here's a organization that pretends to be for peace. And then they are, uh, pulling the strings of the president to make sure that he does things that will prolong World War I. And that blew his mind. Um, I can give lots of other stories of people that have bumped into things that has blown their mind and then they woke up. I mean, they realized things are not what they seem to be. Um, A relative of mine through marriage the CIA tried to recruit him and in the recruiting process, they told him how they control all the media of the United States. Well, in the event, he didn't get, he didn't uh, get hired, but ever after that, he realized what he reads in the papers is what the CIA wants you to know (laughs) because they control it all. What's I it just called? think Operation like that. Blue Book or something like that. Yeah, that that's part of it. Um, yeah. So, so this is the. There's different ways that people can wake up, and and uh, so it, it's not one one particular tactic that you can do that's going to work with everybody, and it's got to be something that touches that person to the core, and then they. Once they get, like, there's been watershed events like JFK getting assassinated. That Mm -hmm. woke up a lot of people. 9-11 woke up a lot of people. Right. Um, The way Hillary has acted woke up a lot of people. Um, There's just been events along the lines. Well, and then COVID. That woke up a lot. Yeah, in the medical industry. (laughs) So um, I know uh, um, one Christian family at one point, and at the time that COVID came, they were just liberals in California. And then they saw what happened and they're like, whoa, and it woke them up and they became Christian. Um, Wow. So different strokes for different folks. But once a person wakes up in one area, it's like the spell's been shattered and then they can see the truth across the board. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, I think our, um, 
reminded uh, one of your podcasts, you talked about these being red pill moments, uh, red <laughs> pill, right? If I'm not mistaken. And, the, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I think I thought along these lines already, I'm, um, people who probably listen to the show don't know I'm, I'm African American, um, but I'm, um, I'm Caribbean. So my mom's from Aruba, my dad's from Jamaica. And they came to this country with, you know, a, a different understanding than most black people did. And, you know, and so they had to learn the culture and learn a lot of different things. And they also had a little bit of an inherent distrust because they didn't come from this country, you know? And so I sort yeah. of, I sort of inherited some of that, just sort of thinking, okay, everything's not as, you know, not as it is um, in the papers or in the news and the media. But I think once the whole jab thing started happening, it, it gave me a, a different type of understanding as just to how deep this goes. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, I think now, and what, what I hear you saying is it's going to happen. Eventually people will wake up and as the Holy spirit is, is doing his work, God is doing his work. He's touching people in different ways to sort of wake them up so that they can be actively engaged in, in the kingdom or the proclaiming the kingdom um, in their arena, the um, one the one question I have for you, and that sort of goes with this, is um, right now, you know, we're gearing up for another round. You know, winter's coming. We got an election coming. You know, they're already talking about the WEF and the WHO and mask mandates and all this stuff, and you know what the plan is. And then on the in a totally different arena, they're saying, okay we've made contact with UAPs and UFOs and all sorts of stuff. And so I just, I see this weird sort of storm brewing where, you know, they're, they're pushing for 2030 as this year of, I guess, a culmination of sorts. And it might just happen that again, we get a little bit more um, of the clamp being put down on people's personal lives but then on top of that, we start to see things happen around us that are sort of out of this world, you know? Um, so, you know, with that, you know, it's like, what do you, what do you think about um, uh, quote unquote, the reptilians, secret space programs, or, um, you know, the UFOs, is that just a part of the deception? Are they just fallen angels or, 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 you know, what, what is, how does that look like in your, your research, your findings? Yeah, that, that, that's a big topic that you could write books about, but the yeah. boiling it all down to a simple answer, <clears throat> the aliens, that is a deception. These are fallen angels and demons. Um, this is uh, very much connected to Satanism, mm -hmm. and um, and it's it's a long term deception. You know, the right. longer it goes, the the more people are being sucked in to believe it. And uh, yeah, it, it's it's a really dangerous deception because the Illuminati at some point want to turn this planet over to the aliens they have told me that uh and um and and it sounds good if these you know these intelligent benevolent aliens that are half a mil evolved a half a million years ahead of us um are going to lead us we are going to help us save ourselves you know from from our our own selves because supposedly mankind's going to self-destruct. Well, they're self-destructing us. Most people, if right. left to their own devices, would be quite peaceful and productive. But they have all these mechanisms to destroy our economy, to destroy our culture. In my lifetime, I've watched our culture be totally destroyed. Right. And that was all by plan. And so, uh, you know, people are going to fall for this deception and think, that uh, the aliens are here to rescue us. And that's sad because they're just from Satan's kingdom. 
That makes sense. And I think that was sort of the conclusion I had. I, you, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around it because you hear people, um, especially right now, you can find on YouTube people coming out of a quote unquote super, uh, uh, space program or secret space program. And they're meeting with beings and entities. But most of the time, uh, almost hands down, what you find is that they're not benevolent beings. Most of them are not um, operating on our behalf, you know. And I think that's the weird thing is I think we've come into this idea as a, uh, a lot of people, whether they're Christian or not, come into this idea that they're here for us and they're going to help us. And I sort of, it goes into that sort of paradigm of what the Antichrist would want people to believe is that he's going to be a false messiah, you know, and that whatever happens, whatever deceptions put out, he's going, uh, you know, to, to help humanity achieve uh, either some sort of um, higher consciousness or to, um, you know, be relieved of some sort of uh, plague or devastation on the earth. Um, but like you said, I, I think it's all cause or all causation of the plans that are set in motion already. So it's kind of scary, you know, but I, I think, um, I think God is allowing people to see for a reason right now in this day and age for a reason. And so that, um, I know we're coming to the end of it. I wanted to ask you, Probably, probably a question you haven't gotten before or a lot, but how, how do Christians pray or how do we engage with the battle? Because I know it's a spiritual battle. I know our prayers are powerful. And I know that, you know, for instance, when Daniel, he's praying and fasting for 21 days, an angel breaks through, you know, from the third mm -hmm. heaven into the first. And even now, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of prophets talking about angelic activity, you know, and it's mm -hmm. increasing. So, I mean, with that said, you know, how do we, are we to be, um, you know, binding and loosing, are we, you know, loosing legions of angels? Um, you know, I hear there's a lady named Laura Sanger, who I really like. She talks about taking over the land, taking over the territory, um, praying over spaces, you know. Um, but what is, what is something that you found, because I know you've done work with people too, so that's pretty awesome. So what is it that, you know, we can do? How can we be actively engaged? Okay. Yeah. I'd love to answer that. And I would like to go 15 minutes over an hour. Yeah, let's do it. This is such a good interview that, um, I want to, uh, spend a little bit more time than I had originally wanted, um, and then when I finish, I'm going to spend some time with my family, my yeah. beautiful, wonderful family. But this yeah. is really going well. I, I'm really enjoying this interview and your approach. It's very rare that I get to uh, approach the subject like this you, from your perspective. So how do we pray? <clears throat> well, I think there's some misconceptions out there about prayer. And I think more people should focus more on getting right with God than they should in trying to have power. Uh, yeah. Modern Christianity, they want these modern uh, preachers, they're promising their people power. Well, that's not really what Christ promised people. Um God is going to speak to you. God is going to help you in certain circumstances. One of those circumstances is if you are in strong fellowship with him. Now, what creates barriers to that fellowship? What creates barriers? Well, sin. Mm -hmm. People need to get their lives cleaned up and, and be able to fellowship and hear God. And God is sovereignly going to do things. There's been a number of times, and I'm not going to say them over this because they're like pearls to me, you know. Right, I don't yeah, want to yeah, throw pearls before swine. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I don't know your audience, and and it's possible that everybody out there listening is 
a spirit-led Christian, but there might be others that will just take it and trample on it. So, but there's been times that God's God sovereignly come to me and said, I want you to pray for this. And when that when he sovereignly came to me, I realized it was God's spirit telling me this, what to pray for. And I knew he he laid it on my heart very clear that because he had asked me to pray for this, when I prayed for it, it would come to pass. And and so uh, I could have that assurance that, yes, this is God's will. So we want to pray in God's will. We want to be in the center of what he's doing. But what is God doing? Well, we won't know what God's doing unless we are in fellowship with him. So it all goes back to get right with God, you know. And and once you've got that channel of, of open fellowship with him, then you're going to see what he's doing and God can use you. If you look in the scriptures, You'll and you ask yourself, in like in the New Testament, when was God doing miracles? And you will notice that the pattern is is right on the cutting edge of evangelism. So it's important for us to be drawing people to Christ, because right there on that cutting edge of evangelism, and in 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 the case of my ministry or my calling. Um, my, my evangelism was more exposing the darkness, um, than, than anything else, but there were miracles, there were miracles going on. And, uh, this is where you're going to see miracles, people, if you're wanting miracles. Uh, and if you're praying according to God's will, you know, it's going to happen. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. And I think um, what that means, you said getting right with God. I think for the listeners out there, I think what that means is, um, you know, like you said, is having fellowship with the Lord. It's it's not praying just for the against the opposition. It's praying for closeness um, of relationship. And I think the scripture is very clear is out of the relationship with Jesus, out of the relationship with the Lord, then um, there's an overflow. There's an overflow of love. And then there's an overflow of that. There is the power and authority of the Lord, but it doesn't Can I jump in here and give an example of what I'm saying? Yeah, go ahead. I'd love it. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, Um, no, go ahead. So there are people and, and they're well-meaning and I'm not, criticizing them i'm just saying that there's a better way there are people and like they go into a public building and they're like okay i cast that demon in that corner out and i cast this demon and i you know and they're you know i'm going to clear this building of all these dark demons and that are in it and over it and whatever right i'm taking authority here okay but let us look at what christ did Christ was, oh man, he was so godly. He was so pure. He was, mm. he said, I and the Father are one, you know, and and I do the works of the Father. And he's just, he is God in love. Um, he was God's uh, expression of love to us. You know, when you look at Christ, you see how God loved. He was that close, you know. And so, when Christ would go into a building, what would happen? Well, wherever he went, if there were demons, they fled. They don't yeah. want to be around somebody that godly. So if you yeah. want to have power over demons, instead of going into a building and casting them out, get yourself right with God, so pure, so holy, that the demons don't even want to be around you. I've seen when I've walked into rooms, Total strangers go, well, and they don't know how to say it. So they say it. Oh, you're a religious person. Mm. And, and, and I don't, I'm not a religious person, but they yeah. mean you're a godly Christian is what they're right. trying to say. You know, and people 
I've seen people mm -hmm. try to leave the area. They don't want to be around you. Yeah. They're evil and they don't want to be around a good person that has the, the anointing of the spirit on them. Yep. It, it, does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And that reminds me of, of, I think it's Peter. He's walking through the towns and people are being healed in his shadow. And yeah. he's, he's, not, he's not trying to do anything. He's just actively pursuing the Lord. And the Lord is on Thank him. You. Yeah. That, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I, and I think what, what, I think what people can take away from, from what you're saying is that if we're engaged with the spirit of God, um, he hovers over us. He hovers over our waters almost, you know, and, um, the power of God being on you is, is more powerful than our, even our words. You know, it's like when you pray in a heavenly language, or you pray and you know you're praying in tongues or, or whatever it is you don't even know what you're saying you know it's yeah. just the spirit, the spirit of god is just moving in you and through you and he's mm -hmm. using your vessel you know which is uh which is interesting to think because it means that we're more receiving than you know actively giving or actively participating as we think you know as we think we should as good christians um right. and that, that's a good point i think we've gone through many ages where we've gone through, uh, I guess we had prophetic ages in the church. We've had deliverance ages in the church. And I think um, I, I like to call it the kingdom age. You know, I just, I just feel as if we're coming into a time where we're not going to know what the heck to do. And so we, we hear the word of the Lord when we go yeah. into spaces, you know, and we're going to go in knowing that it might be a darkened space but we're going to go in knowing that we're with the Lord, you know, right. and, and that's really, I, I think I, I like your perspective because it takes the onus off of us. You know, I think so many times we think like we have to do, you know, a million different rituals. We've, you know, nothing wrong with, um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, sorry, my daughter's just popped up here. Um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, anointing your spaces. There's nothing wrong with, um, you know, praying over people, the laying on of hands or whatever. But I think what happens is sometimes we, we, we get into a space of understanding ourselves of having to operate in the power, in the strength, you know, as if it's us versus the enemy or us versus, you know, the quote unquote demon in the room. And, and I think, I think that gets us into trouble because I think we forget, you know, who's, who's the real power, you know, who's the exactly. real authority exactly. and, and what, yeah, what this is all about, you know? So we um, have, we have a lot of worldliness in the churches and one of them is this interest in fads. So what you have these ministers doing it's like spiritually they're putting their finger up and seeing which way the wind is blowing. Oh, this is the popular fad in the church this week. And so then then that's what their church will follow. You know, we're going to do this. And then a month later, it's some other fad. And they're, they're, they're way off base. Um, they're just wind testers and then chasing after whichever direction the wind is blowing within the Christendom. But what they need to do is, is, is focus on building a solid relationship with, with Christ and, and God, their father and the Holy spirit where they don't have these weaknesses because what happens is, is Satan will attack you in that one spot that you don't have good armor. The one spot that you're weak, you can be, you can count that that's where he will attack you. And, right. and, and so we are so dependent on the good Lord to get us through all of this. So this is my, la this is my last question then, and this will flow into it is, the, the, the sanctification process. Um, 
what do what does a per, what does a person do to get right with God, or you know how how do we as you know how do we um, up our game so to speak? I know it's probably simple, you know, prayer, uh, you know, spending time with God. But what I guess my better question is, what do you do? You know, how do you you know seek out the Lord in your day to day? The big breakthrough, and I don't know if, if other people can identify with this, my big breakthrough was when I just decided to go all out when I resigned from West Point and totally obey God no matter what he asked. And uh, I know a lot of Christians, they like to say, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. They just toss the whole Old Testament into the garbage can. They shouldn't do that. Um so, you know, obedience is the first step. And in fact, that's why Christ, he looked at this Roman centurion. And, and I have thought of that story so many times. If you think of what a Roman centurion was, he's a pagan. He's a leader of a, 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 an officer in a pagan army. And Christ said nobody had more faith in Israel than this centurion. Why? Because he understood authority. And we need to understand the authority of God and that uh, how that authority of God is how we have authority. Um, there, there, there is a lot involved in authority, but the foundation of that authority is us being obedient to God and him being able to work through us. Um, you, you can imagine if you have an employee and he does his own thing, He's pretty worthless, you know, um, yeah. and and even if, if he's like, oh, I'm going to stay busy when you haven't given me anything to do. Yeah. But if he's doing things that you're not interested in having done, it doesn't matter that he's busy. <laughs> you want him doing things that you want him to do. <laughs> uh, and we're so busy. We have our lives cluttered up with doing so much garbage it has nothing to do with what God wants. I think that's a good point. And I think that's I think that's why this last go round with the whole jab thing woke up a lot of people because it, it threw us out of our routines. Yeah. Um I noticed even myself I was worshiping longer at home. You know, we'd put on some music at, in the house and instead of it being a fifteen minute deal, we were just like, you know what, let's let's you know, let's worship for thirty minutes or you know, or forty minutes or um, you know, let me dig into this. I have more time now. Let me dig into this book or dig into the, you know, and it just sort of expanded my idea of what it meant to be a Christian, you know, um, you know, not that I didn't love the Lord, but I think, you know, looking around and seeing, you know, you look at the news and, you know, you're, you're confronted with these things. You're saying, okay, you know, what is, what is my life about? What is, you know, if my job goes, what's going to happen? If this person goes, if I lose my life or my wife, you know, get sick, what does this all mean? You know, and so I think people are starting to cherish the more important things, you know, and it can go either way. I think a lot of people made poor decisions. There was a lot of divorces. I have a couple of friends that went through some, you know, some some tough times in their marriage because the whole structure of everything that they built sort of crumbled. You know, you have wow. two parents at home now instead of one gone for nine to five. And as a husband, the only thing he had to do was say goodnight to his kids, so to speak, sit on the couch, watch Monday Night Football or watch TV with his wife and binge on Netflix. And, you know, nothing against watching TV, but it was just that the, the routines got kind of got cleared out. And so it kind of allowed people to sort of see what really you know, what their lives were built on. And I think that's, uh, I think to your point, I think a lot of people, will, they're going to end up getting right with God when, when things fall apart, you know, and um, it sucks that that's sometimes what has to happen, but I believe God is going to be waking his people up as, as they are confronted with what they've built their lives on. You know, and so a lot of time, uh, their time uh, cycles and everything that they're a part of, they'll start to have to take a good look at it, I think. 
Yeah, Christ in John 17, he, he basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, if you want to know that, that my words are the truth, try them out and you'll find that they are. The thing is, is our lives are so busy out there. People are so busy. They don't take Christ's words at face value. They don't try them out. They don't see that he will uh, sustain them. They don't see all of these truths that he was teaching people because they're too busy involved with the world. And um, and I think that's one of Satan's biggest uh, tools is just distraction, busyness. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. I think... Um... Wow, I didn't I didn't know we were going to take this turn. We got uh, I got a little sermon from you. I thank you for that. Um, that was, that was really <laughs> I was a, a house pa- I was a house minister for a while, but that's okay. not my calling. My calling's to the whole body of Christ, not just Amen. to a local congregation. Amen. Well, I think that whoever you end up, you know, I, I'm hoping that you continue. To not only share your testimony, but that you continue to share what the Lord has put on your heart, because I think, you know, it's like you've been building an ark or building, uh, God has been building in you uh, to, to be the ark, to hold, you know, uh, a, a, a good genealogy, so to speak. And I, I really do think that, you know, it, there's, a, there's a flood coming, you know, and I, I think that, you know, he wants to pour spirit on all flesh. And so I'm hoping, you know, you'd be encouraged to know, like, you know, your message is very timely um, and it's needed for this generation. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you, man. And um, before we go, I wanted to ask you, um, can people, um, well, well, first off, did you have anything else you wanted to share or or, um, I didn't want to cut you off? Oh, we're going to see a, a shaking of all the foundations. Yeah, yeah I wanted know. to ask you, what, what's your, me- like, what, what is, a, I guess, a closing message to the people of God right now, or just all of humanity in general? You know, I, I guess one important thing that the Bible keeps emphasizing is be of good courage. You know, we have to be of good courage. We can't be fearful. A spirit of fear is not going to help us. It's going to paralyze us. And there's a lot of people out there spreading fear. But we have to be like David and be able to go up against these Goliaths, go up against these lions and bears. We need that courage. And we need to be like Daniel. Daniel said, I'm not going to eat the king's food. You know, you got to start looking at what's in the supermarket. That's the king's food. And it's not healthy. You know, you need to um, you need to be like these great uh, men of faith in the past. Um, so. Uh, be walking forward. Uh, without fear and, and, and people are like, well, yeah, but if I oppose the system, they're going to get angry at me. They're, I'm going to lose mm-hmm. my job. Well, people. <laughs> They have us at the edge of a cliff. They are ready to push us off that cliff. And and we are going to fall into the Grand Canyon. You're worried that if you push against them, that they're going to get upset. Do you understand people where we're at? They're, they're, they're getting ready to push us off the cliff. Yeah, Fight we've got back. nothing to lose. We've got nothing to lose already. You have nothing to lose. Stand up for God and let him be your effectiveness. You know, no, in our own strength, we can't do anything. Jonah, he didn't think he could do anything with Nineveh, you know. Um, but but he moved forward because God clobbered him over the head enough that he finally quit uh chickening out and went ahead and did what he was called to do um so that's where we're at people amen and that verse for you guys um i'm gonna read the amplified real quick and then my brother's gonna pray for us 
Um, I think it's the see Second Timothy one seven, the Amplified. It says, "For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline." Abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. Um, amen. Um, can you pray for us? Pray us out? And then, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, oh. before we do that, can you tell us where to find any of your information or books or uh, tapes or CDs or whatever, recordings? Um, I haven't been, I haven't gotten my website back. Mm -hmm. Um uh really running um and honey remind me what my website is pin, yeah pin tracks sorry I, i'm tired no you're fine my my pin tracks.com p-e-n-p-r-a-c-k-s.com pin tracks.com uh is okay. my website and i have a few articles up there and and they're able to order my Bloodlines of the Illuminati book. Um, and that's maybe a starting point. And then if you can find any of my uh, people, if you can find any of my talks on the Internet, most of them have been uh, uh, wiped out. Uh, and, and it's hard to find me on, on the Internet anymore. But there's some. There's some recent interviews that I've done this last year that are still up there. Um, so that that would be a place that they could start. Um, there's also a professional uh, interview of me. And I think I'll, I will send that to you, Anwar. And um, are, are people going to be able to make comments below this? They okay. probably will, and what I yeah they they will, okay. and I'm well, putting you... on Spotify and Rumble. I might not put okay. it on YouTube because I've gotten flagged a couple times already for some of the stuff I've said. So, so I will I will uh, give you the link where people can can watch a professional interview of me that's really good, Great. and um, I think it's like the best um interview of me that's awesome yeah you have to pay you can you can watch the trailer for free um but yeah you'll have to pay a little bit but then um i do get a percentage of of the royalties from the interview that's besides good. That's, the yeah that's what i wanted um, i wanted to make sure people could support your ministry somehow yeah, thanks. And um, and, and then uh, if you want to email me, my email address is Springmeyer. And just, it's all lowercase. Look up how to spell my name, Springmeyer. Messages, all one word, Springmeyer messages at hotmail.com. And awesome. um, yeah, cool. and, and, you. and then you're probably wanting me to pray. So, yeah, I would love it if you pray for us and just pray, <laughs> pray not just oh. for us, but also just pray for our country, pray for, um, you know, whatever God puts in your heart, you know, and pray for the people. Okay. Heavenly Father, we know you love us more than we love ourselves. And I want to pray good things into the listeners' lives. I want to pray a fresh anointing of your spirit upon them so that they would love you. They would love life. They would, they would start making decisions for for life, and that they would would just cling to you, and that you would open up to them a vision of what they should do with their lives and how they can get through these dark times. And Heavenly Father, we want to renounce all of these evil spirits that are in our lives, and we want to loosen your Holy Spirit into our life. So that we can have this fresh anointing, because unless you save us, unless you, unless you lead us, we are not going to be able to do it. We're totally dependent on you, and we just want to confess that to you, Heavenly Father, that we're totally dependent on you, and we love you so much, and we thank you that no matter how dark things can get, if we love you, you will continue to 
to sustain us and get us through these dark times. And so this is our prayer, Heavenly Father, through Yeshua HaMashiach, Christ, Jesus Christ, whatever people want to call our great Lord and Savior who died on the cross for us. We love him, and we are so thankful for his shed blood, and we pray this through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And I'll just pray a blessing of you and your family. Lord Jesus, I thank you for my brother. And Lord, I thank you that God, um, you've given him words, dreams, vision, understanding, deeper knowledge, uh, creativity to produce, and a prophetic imagination, Lord. I pray a blessing over his family, a hedge of protection over his family, his job. I pray that there be favor over him in the marketplaces, and that God, as he moves in these days, Lord, you would give him more opportunity to share his testimony, share the message you've given him. And Lord, more importantly, um, to operate uh, as your kingdom dictates, Lord, to help set captives free, to help proclaim the kingdom, and to help heal the sick, Lord Jesus. I thank you for his life. I thank you for the safety you've put over him. And I just thank you for um, just the hedge of protection and the angelic community that, um, that surround him and his family, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Emma, for a blessed time. I, I really enjoyed this interview. Amen. Well, this might not be the last one, so don't be surprised if you get another message from me saying, hey, you want to do another podcast? Um, I will I will be in touch, and, um, you know, if, if you could, um, you know, send me any links you have, and I'll definitely, um, you know, send you back some links and stuff like that once I get this all up and running and, you know, put on some different um, avenues. Thank you. All right. Well, blessings, my brother. Same to you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Have a blessed evening. Thank Good night. You.